Hi all. In his book, Culture Shift, David Henderson points out that we live in a world of lone rangers who are isolated, guarded, and self-concerned. He suggests that in a world in which men and women experience about as much meaningful interaction as a pair of Barbies side by side on the shelf at Walmart, two messages beg to be communicated. First, men and women need to be called away from a life of self-sufficiency into a life of dependence. The pride that stands behind our independence is at odds with God's calling. No one can be subject to two kings at the same time. The second people, thing people need to hear is the call into community. Christianity and community are inseparable. It is not possible to be a Christian in the way God intends and remain a loner. We can't stay in orbit around each other. Isolation is not an option. We are called to honest and caring relationships with those who share the bond of faith with us. When we come to Christ, self-forgetfulness, gracious encouragement, and sacrificial service move out of the optional category and into the one marked required. This becomes our duty, to lay down our lives for each other, just as Christ laid down his life for us. Now, if there's anything the coronavirus pandemic has been teaching us, it is that physical distancing may be necessary, but social isolation is certainly not an option. We need one another. And this is what Peter is telling us in 1 Peter 1, 22-2-3. He says, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Peter grounds the command to fervently love one another from the heart in the reality of our salvation. If we have been born again, we have been born again into a community of sinners whose souls have been purified by obedience to the truth. Now, this doesn't mean that we earn salvation by our works. Obedience to the truth means the willing acceptance of the gospel. It is through believing God's eternal message of salvation embodied in the person and work of Jesus Christ that we have been born again. As such, Peter points out that we have a new nature which must find expression in fervent, unremitting love for other believers in keeping with Jesus' own command in John 13, 34-35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Peter is emphasizing that while salvation is personal and individual, it is not individualistic. Our experience of God's saving love must motivate and enable us to persevere in loving those whom he loves. This means that our love must be profoundly self-giving, in keeping with God's love. And it must be enduring, in keeping with the eternal quality of God's word. Such love is to be the hallmark of this community known as the church. Now, unfortunately, we do have to admit that this is not quite a reality in many churches. Many of us have been turned off by the hypocrisy of many who name the name of Christ and yet care only for themselves. This is not to excuse our lack of love, but we need to recognize that this is part of the tension of living in between the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his second coming. We have been justified through faith in Christ, but we remain sinners who are objects of the gracious transforming work of the Spirit. We are already saved, but there is a sense in which we are being saved and we will be saved. Peter is very conscious of this reality since he speaks of growing in respect to salvation. Growing in respect to salvation 
refers to our growing towards God's ultimate purpose for us, which is Christ-likeness of character. And for this reason, he admonishes us then to put aside all malice, all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. All of these are attitudes and habits inconsistent with love and harmful to the health of the community. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander are inextricably linked with one another. They are offshoots of the pride of our hearts. See, in our pride, we think ourselves better than anybody else. And so when we see others' gifts and blessings, we become envious of them and bear them ill will or malice. Our malice leads to slander or speaking evil of others. And since we're aware that it's wrong and we don't like looking bad, we speak evil underhandedly with a compliment to balance every put down. So we look fair and objective. And of course, this means that we are also being deceitful and hypocritical. How then do we, do, do we put these vile habits away? By dealing with the pride of our hearts through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of salvation by faith in Jesus' death and resurrection is designed to break down our pride by making us conscious of the fact that we of ourselves are helpless and hopeless. Whatever we might be wanting to boast of is revealed to be worthless in the eyes of God. We are all exposed as paupers in need of God's grace. We receive salvation as a gift, not on our terms, but on God's terms. And even our progress in the faith is dependent on God's gracious provision, since He tells us to be like newborn babies longing for God's Word so that we might grow. Now, I used to think that this meant only new believers, but when you look closely at the text, you realize that Peter was talking to everyone who has tasted the kindness of God. In other words, no matter how long you've been a Christian, the reality of your continuing struggle for growth should humble you as it makes you aware of your ever-present need for God's grace. In fact, the reality of the Christian life is that the more you grow, the more conscious you become of your need for Christ. And I pray that all of us would take Peter's spirit-inspired admonition seriously so that we would be able to live out more fully Christ's call to humble submission and dependence on Him in loving relationship with Him and with His people, and thereby be better witnesses for the gospel.